Welcome back to the shrine for the hand-me-downs of the industry. Well, while you were sleeping, the development didn't stop. I kept working on the forging process to make a, a tappet that will accept uh, this roller bearing. Uh, so here's the first one that I shown in a previous video. Uh, this was heated up in a kiln. The heating took about um, three hours and it created a lot of scale and you can see when I forged the tool into the part the tool was cutting the part rather than displacing the material so inside there is a clear cut line so the tool looks just like this except that it has a radius dressed on the edge right here I don't know how much the video is going to show it but there's a clear cut line inside so the tool was basically cutting into the material rather than displacing the material and I think one of the issues was that this part was cool when I started to forge it and also there was a rapid heat transfer from the tool into the forging die so the first thing that I worked on uh, was the inductive heater and you saw the inductive heater and what I ended up doing is basically set up the inductive heater and the chiller and now they are working. I did some tests to see how fast I can heat up a piece of steel like this and then I ended up altering one of the coils so that is one and a half inch inside diameter and it's about six turns and the original one was three inch in diameter and about three turns so this allows a lot faster uh, heating of the component I can get this thing red hot in about 20-25 seconds and so the heat is also localized so I'm only heating the upper section of the part where the actual forging process is going to take place the lower section of the part is is not as hot it's not red hot let's put it that way so this was the pair of pliers that I used to hold the part in the inductive heater and so the idea is that I'm holding the part like so and I put it in a coil and what happened here is there's a lot of surface area as you can see of the tool itself of the plier itself so the plier was getting hot and you can see that there are telltale signs on the plier uh, you know there's discoloration from all that heat um, which is okay but the problem became that it got so hot that this insulation on the plier started to burning off so I'm holding this in a pair of gloves and you know I didn't feel that heat because the handle and the gloves insulated me from that but you can clearly see that this plastic insulation uh, got soft and remelted so I had to go and find a different way of holding uh, the part so I rated my 50 cent bin I do have a 50 cent bin right now for the next garage sale where I'm collecting uh, you know tools that I don't like or I don't want to use and uh, this is basically just one of those combination pliers I did some alteration to it. I drilled out that hole so now the pin is not sliding. And uh, I also welded two tongs to it. And you can see how the tongs look. So this is designed just to hold this part. So I can put the part in like so. And the coil is around right here and so the coil is heating up 
this little cross section here and uh, it's not uh, dumping so much heat uh, well the well is not my most beautiful welds because these are dissimilar materials uh, this is just a soft steel and this is some kind of alloy steel the next change I did uh, that I mounted the bottom tool to a uh, tree stump basically a custom made tree stump that I used for years to cut firewood on <laughs> as you can see it works fine the next thing I did is uh, I altered the upper tool so this is the upper tool and I did some tests and uh, this, ro this ring here that acts as a limiter so, so when I hit this the whole thing goes down and this tube, this piece of tube basically hits the bottom here and it limits the travel so that the tool will not go beyond its point it just goes to a certain depth so this tube had a press fit with the upper section and it was always breaking loose so what I did is I welded it around so now it's a single component basically the other thing I had to do is I added three of these braces and you can see the braces tie in with these bolts so when I hit it and it springs back it's not gonna fly into lowered orbit and then every time I had to put it back because there's a lot of energy stored in this spring and the spring is capable of shooting this out into the air so these are all the changes for the tooling as far as uh, the pre-machined parts go the initial part uh, that I created just use the simple tool path where a quarter inch tool just came in like so and then it created that half rounded cavity obviously you know it was going down and down and down and then finally it created a, a finished pass now the problem with that is you cannot cut a quarter inch slot with a quarter inch end mill because what happens is um, you know it's gonna have run out and you need to evacuate the chips so there's all kind of problems involved but that slot will become about you know six and a half millimeters instead of six point three five so six and a half six point seven millimeters that's what I measured so what I ended up doing is I took the cavity uh, that I'm striving for you know this this forged cavity I took that uh, shape and I basically offset the machining 0.4 millimeters and I came in with a 5 millimeter end mill and with the end mill now I can go and basically create that pocket and so if you look inside you can see how the end mill created um, these ridges inside so after the machining there are some artifacts of the machining uh, left behind so that's the design that I have right now and this is uh, what I'm gonna test so here's one of the old ones that was carved out with a quarter inch I recut it with the mill um, I don't know maybe I'm, I'm gonna start with that one but I'm gonna heat a couple of these up and then I will try to forge it so let's see how it comes out
that is the result of the first forging. Here's the second one. Fresh from the forge, two new tappets were minted. They are not perfect, but they are not far from being perfect. Um, got some tool marks inside from the CNC machining process as you can see there are some remaining tool marks in this area here there's also tool marks on this side so it seems that this was not perfectly aligned it was uh, clocked a couple degrees when the tool came in and then the tool tried to rotate it but it didn't rotate it perfectly so because of that there are some tool marks here so you can see on this side there are some tool marks down here and basically a mirror image on the other side here's the other one this also has the tool marks the machining marks remaining from from the CNC process trying to try my best to show it to you here's the other one again you can see the residual tool marks from the CNC machining process so as the ball and mill went down and carved out little by little those layers are still visible doesn't have much mill scale I can tell you the swift heating process did its magic and didn't create too much uh, mill scale um, I found something here uh, that I did not consider before this is the tappet from the Harley and you can see the roller when I put in it has a little bit of axial play but not much why is that important well because there's going to be a pin in this hole there are a plurality of uh, rollers in you know around the, the pin and those rollers can march out if there's a lot of axial play and right now if I put the roller in you can see that mine has more than a millimeter of axial play I would say it's uh, you know one sixteenth of an inch or 1.5 millimeter so that worries me I can essentially rework the tool and then change this taper angle from two degrees to maybe one degree but then I'm running a chance of locking the tool in which basically I can help that with lubricant so I will need to find some kind of forging lubricant I'm pretty sure there's something 
specially designated for forging, you know, some kind of high temperature lubricant. Here's three more that I forged and uh, I think by far this is the best looking. It's got straight sides, it's not crooked, it's nice and centered. And you can see that this one has kind of S shape and S curve in it. And then this one, look at that, I heated it too much so when I heat it too much what happens it just sparkles like a sparkler and then a piece of metal will just reflow and just vanish. So that's all you see is just end up with a hole. It's like a bad welding job. You know when you touch something thin metal with a welder electrode and it burns right through. You can see the same on the other side. Now this was something I was worrying about that this corner here when when I forged the tool into it it will break through but that wasn't the issue. The issue was that when I'm heating it up this is a real narrow cross section and so a lot of heat is generated here so this is the bottleneck. I cannot heat this thing up to yellow hot. I can only heat it up to let's say red hot because if I'm going for yellow hot this will already reflow here. You know this is, uh, this is why they send an unmanned rocket to the moon with the Artemis mission because they want to test out the system so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm developing something, testing the system out and trying out things, see if they work. Um, really far ahead from where I was a year ago <laughs> and probably way behind from where I'm gonna be a year from now. I looked into the uh, mechanics of the forging process so you saw earlier I recorded some um, high-speed videos that was just done with my iPhone which is uh, running at high speed so it's not 30 frames per second but it's actually 160 frames per second and I, I did some hand calculation so that mass of the hammer is uh, 7.6 7 pounds it, it, it says on the hammer it, it's an 8 pound sledgehammer but I took it apart weighed it you know the, the handle weighs around one and a half pounds so uh, the mass of the hammer is 3.45 kilos, you know, three and a half kilos. I'm running 160 frames per second. Uh, so one, the, the length of one frame is about uh, 6.3 milliseconds. Um, and what I saw in the pictures, when a hammer is striking in each frame, it's going to go about one full length of the hammer which is 165 millimeters. So all that jazz is going to result 26.4 meters per second velocity when the hammer is striking, you know, the, the top of the tool. So that will result 1200 joules of energy and then the entire section when the tool penetrates into the piece it's going to travel 16 millimeters or 5 8 of an inch. So that would result 75,000 newtons of force or 7.66 tons, metric tons. Um, honestly I doubt it. There's a lot of other things involved. I just did a back of a napkin calculation, kind of you know just do a sanity check. Uh, we are also compressing the spring. We are uh, accelerating the mass of the entire moving part of the tool. So I think by the time the tool is going to hit um, the part, um, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to have that much of a force. It's, it's not going to have 7.6 tons. So um, I think this is uh, an intermediate stage for this tool. I'm already working on something else 
trying to improve on the forging process um, come back and uh, check it out it will be probably a couple of weeks from now hope you guys enjoyed the video and uh, maybe learned something maybe just enjoyed it and had a kick out of it seeing me stumble in the workshop trying to get this thing to work um, if you're not subscribed please do so or just come back and check out the video in a couple of weeks see you next time bye nice little forging